Hey guys, welcome back to Online Camp. I uh, really hope you've been enjoying them so far. My name's Joel, uh, I'm one of the AGs or site administrators at camp, which means basically I'm running around trying to coordinate you guys, make sure you're in the right place at the right time, uh, which is great fun, but sadly we can't do it this year. Uh, this is my wife Charlotte. Hi guys, yeah, we are both gutted that we can't be with you on site. We look over to the Perbex for a Bournemouth beach and are so upset that we cannot be there this year and... It's terribly sad. It's terribly sad. But online camp is amazing and we really, really hope that you enjoy day one and we've got so much planned for the rest of the week. So please stay tuned, please stay active on our social media channels and that's a great way for us to be able to con like communicate with each other and get the feel of camp throughout this week. Yeah, and uh, please make sure you share with your friends, show them how great camp is and uh, hopefully we can make it bigger and better and more exciting and action packed next year. Uh, so I'll pray quickly and then uh, we'll, I won't waffle on, uh, we'll hand over to everything we've got packed for today. Father God, I thank you for camp, I thank you for all these campers who um, commit you know, a week of their summer to come to camp and I uh, thank you for um, all, the, all the blessings that uh, occur during camp. Lord, uh, although we can't do it in person this year, I thank you for online camp um, uh, and I pray you would just work through that. Amen. Amen. Pizza. 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 With anchovies. Breakfast. 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 Cooked breakfast. Leftover bacon. Eggy bread. Porridge. 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 Porridge or pizza. I can't choose. Curry and poppadoms. Curry. Curry night. Chicken curry. Roast dinners. Roast beef. Pork roast dinner with apple crumble and custard with ice cream. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive All my failures I try To hide It was my turn Till I met you When you called my name I ran out of that grave Out of darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness to your glorious day so glorious now your mercy my soul Now your freedom is all that I know Oh, the old man knew Jesus, when I met you You called my name I needed rescue, my sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, 
I was an orphan, now you've called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. And when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness. Later on this week, we've got uh, loads of people coming to give us talks. We've got uh, Beth, who's been a leader here for a while, and a camper. Uh, we've got Maddie, and we've got James Ryan, who's been leading us in worship. Loads of us are going to be bringing us uh, what God has to say from His Word. Uh, but tonight, like yesterday, it's going to be me again. Sorry about that. Uh, but it's okay because uh, the next bit of Acts is really a cracker as we look at the birthday of the church coming up next. During lockdown, everyone's needed a hobby and Lois and I are no different. We've um, decided to have a baby and she's called Galilee Joy. She was born in April and she's full of joy. And as soon as the baby's born, everyone wants to know about it. They ask, what is it? What is it? Um, and it's not gonna be a surprise, is it? It's either gonna be a girl or a boy. The only surprise is if after all the labor, a camel came out of there or something. Um, but that's the question everyone wants to know. What is it? And today in our story, uh, Acts chapter two, we're gonna look at the birthday of the church. And that's the question we're gonna ask. What is it? What is it? Uh, it's been born. What is it that's been born? I'm gonna use this story, Acts chapter two. Uh, open it if you like, have a look at it. And um, in this story, we're gonna see what it is. What is the church that's being born? And the first thing we're gonna learn is that the church is diverse. After Jesus yesterday has gone uh, to heaven and his disciples are waiting around there's about 120 kind of uh, Christians in those days and they're waiting to see what Jesus is gonna do. They're all waiting together in an upstairs room in Jerusalem. And suddenly as they're praying, one day, there's this violent wind. It completely fills the house. And it says that tongues of flame kind of seem to come from somewhere and they sort of settle and hover over everyone's heads. This kind of violent noise. It's a weird sight, it's a weird noise. It's not an everyday thing that happens. In fact, I think as you read this story, you get the impression that this is a very obvious act of God. And what happens as these kind of tongues of flame settle on people's heads? Well, this is verse five. It says, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. The disciples 
almost as if they can help themselves, just start speaking all these different kinds of languages. And there's lots of places involved. Listen to this. Utterly amazed, they ask, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each one of us hears them in our own native language? Uh, so before we get to the places, these are local people. These are country bumpkins who are doing all this. All the disciples were from Galilee in the north. It'd be a bit like hearing Brian Kite suddenly come out with fluent Italian or Cantonese. It'd just be weird and disorientating. How are they hearing all their own languages? And like I said before, it's lots of different places. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear these disciples declaring the wonders of God in their own language. The crowd is from loads of different countries and they come to this place where the disciples are and they can hear the disciples speaking all different kinds of languages. Places to the north, to the east, to the south, different ethnicities and diversities from each different country. All of these places are kind of being represented now amongst the disciples. And what this means is this, is that God welcomes all kinds of people. Young, old, black, white, rich, poor, foreign if you like, and domestic, people from all different nationalities, as the church is being born, as the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples and they speak all different languages, it's like God is declaring, I am for all different kinds of people. All are welcome. And I love that phrase that it uses. All of us can hear the wonders of God in our own language. Now that's what makes Christianity is such a rich and vibrant religion all the way around the world is because there's a place at the table for every different kind of person. Right at the start, at this first moment when the church is being born, we learn that the church is a diverse place, which means whoever you are, you belong. You belong. The church is diverse. The church also has a message. See, Everything that's happened here, this room filled with tongues of fire, this loud wind, all of a sudden the disciples speaking all kinds of languages, it's a little bit weird. And the crowd who've gathered outside to see it, they're asking, look, what does this mean? What exactly has happened here? And some people even say, these people are drunk. As if, you know, I'm no expert on drinking, but as if when you get drunk, you all of a sudden break into fluent Parisian French. Look, and Peter, the apostle, the leader, stands up and these are the first words of the first ever sermon about Jesus in the church. Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. And he goes on to quote an old poem in the Old Testament which prophesies that things like this will happen on the day that God comes to visit his people. And it's like Peter is saying, the Old Testament says this, you should have expected this. What is happening here was prophesied long ago. This is exactly within God's plan. Let me read a bit of this poem for us. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will also prophesy. See, you guys should have known that this was coming. And then Peter goes on to talk about Jesus. See, he says, look guys, this is foretold because something amazing has happened. Recently in Jerusalem, there was this guy called Jesus. And Jesus did amazing things. Jesus did brilliant things for us all. He healed the sick and he was with all kinds of people. And what happened? Verse 23, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him on the cross. 
It's almost like Peter is saying, look, there was this incredible guy, Jesus, and he was doing amazing things and you ruined him. You killed him. You took a really good thing and you destroyed him. What a ter terrible waste. I like big butts. Here's a great big butt in this story. Verse 24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You guys killed him, but God reversed the decision. He raised him from the dead. There is something more lethal than death, and that is Jesus. Jesus doesn't suffer death. Death suffers Jesus. And he ruined it, and he rose again, and he is the risen king forever. Peter is saying this resurrection from the dead is a historical fact, because he and the rest of the 11 guys stood with him are witnesses to it, eyewitnesses. They'd seen him dead, and then they'd seen him alive again. Look, the Bible has always said this. Peter goes on to quote one of the Psalms in the Old Testament, where David talks about a king who's gonna live forever. And Peter says, look, David died, everyone dies. But they knew that there was a king coming who'd live forever, and that is Jesus. You should have loved him, but you killed him instead. And now he's alive again, and he loves all kinds of people. This is Peter's message there. He is a king, you killed him. And where does that leave you, he says to his crowd. He turns to him and says this in verse 36, therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and King. Look, this is a message for us too. Look, you and I, we didn't kill Jesus in the same way. We weren't alive 2000 years ago, but this message is eternal. And this message is for all humanity. All humanity has mistreated God. We've turned away from him and we've mistreated his son. But God sent God's son, Jesus Christ, to die for sinful people like you and I. He loved us enough that he sent him to us. And though humanity rejected him, God raised Jesus again from the dead so that whoever trusts in Jesus can not suffer death and live forever. Jesus ruined death and he's alive today and he wants all people to come to know him, to know hope and forgiveness and joy. See, it's a powerful message because it's a true message. The people who have stood there, they were really impacted by this. It says this, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's a big word there, and uh, the word was repent. And it's an old fashioned word, and it literally means to change your mind completely. Change your mind about Jesus. Don't reject him anymore, but become one of his people. You'll receive a gift. God's Holy Spirit. See, God himself is the greatest gift that we all need. And it's given to us for free. There is nothing more precious than God's Holy Spirit. Now, this message seemed to work because it says here, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people. I guess at camp every year, we have around 100 people. Imagine 30 camps next to each other. That's how many people from one sermon came to accept the forgiveness that Jesus offers. It is a hugely powerful message. And the reality is that the church has always had this message. There's a thousand different ways of telling it. There's kind of sermons and chatting and poetry and all sorts. There's loads of different parts of the Bible, but it's all about Jesus. How he came and rose again for hope. The church has a message. And lastly, I guess the church is a loving family. What do the 3,000 people do? What, you know, when you wake up the next day and you've decided to change your mind about Jesus, what does that look like? Well, Acts says that these 3,000 people, they just did family things. They 
uh, kind of learned together and they ate together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and of prayer. They ate together, they prayed together, they did normal family things together. They shared possessions together, they were super generous and they gave to anyone who was needy. They spent loads of time together, chatting and hanging out as if they liked each other. And people joined them every single day so that every day more and more people were there. It says the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Which is unsurprising really because it sounds like an incredible family to be a part of. So look, this is still the case. Church is a really loving family to be a part of. It's like not a biological family, but a family made up of people who belong to God the Father. An example of this, my friend Becca uh, recently moved to a church in London uh, to be closer to her fiance, uh, my friend Connor. And shortly after she moved, she got really poorly. She was quite mentally ill and she had depression. And uh, the church didn't know her very well, but they really looked after her. People were bringing her meals, they were praying for her, they were checking up on her. And all the months that she was poorly, they made sure that they looked after her. They even clubbed together a load of money and helped pay her rent, which in London is a crazy amount of money. And when she got better and kind of went back to church, she said, you know what, through this church, I really understood that I was part of God's loving family. Anyone who wants to can have a family like that today. Partly at camp, we're passionate about local churches, uh, serving local people and growing together. And I think it'd be a great idea to pop along to a local church, either online or when things are back to normal in purpose. They would love to have, have you. And if you want help in finding a local church, we can help that, just contact us. It's been born, what is it? It is diverse, it's got a message, it is a loving family. But why is it like this? Well, it's a good question. People look at Galilee and they ask, you know, why is she so beautiful, so intelligent, so athletic? Uh, and the answer is because her, that's what her mum Lois is like. And they also ask, you know, why does she cry when she wets herself? They say, well, that's because that's what her dad does. Um, and the same is true of the church. The person who's birthed it has stamped his seal of character on it. See, the church is all these things because God loves and is these things. He orchestrated all of this. It's God's Holy Spirit who came down on the day of Pentecost, the birthday of the church, and brought the church together. So it's unsurprising that God's Holy Spirit is like these things. God's Holy Spirit loves diversity and wants all kinds of people to be with him. God the Father loves Jesus and so has made a message that's all about people hearing about Jesus and loving Jesus. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Blessed Trinity, the three-in-one God that the Christians worship is a family and teaches people to come together to love as family. The church is a wonderful, wonderful thing because it's just like a wonderful, wonderful God that we worship. The church is a loving, diverse, incredible family because it's just as wonderful as Jesus is. I think you should get to know him. Let me pray. Father God, thank you so much for this gift that you give to all people of this world, which is called the church. A place where we can really get to know you. I want to pray that we would love the church as your gift to us. Thank you for all these wonderful things that it is. Amen. People come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations of every nation, the kingdom come. So 
Don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up high. Don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from. God, I just want to thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. 
and that you um, leave us with that power here on earth um, before we come and spend eternity with you in heaven, Lord. I just pray right now that your Holy Spirit would fall on every single person watching this, God, that they would just feel you so closely as we hear about Pentecost and when your Spirit first came down to earth. And Jesus, I just pray that this is a time of faith building and of excitement as we prepare to share your word and your gospel with those around us, Lord, that we could be witnesses of you and um, a testament of your love. And so I just pray for Ben right now as he delivers this message, God, would it all be um, words from you, Lord, and would it not be of him, but of you? And I just pray you bless him and the campers that are watching this, God, I just thank you so much for them as individuals and for all the plans that you have for them and um, for who you've created them to be. And I just pray, um, yeah, I just pray that you would come alongside them right now as they listen to this talk, Lord. Would you um, just impart your wisdom to them, impart your spirit to them, and I just pray your blessings over them. In your name, amen. Oh God, I just want to pray and lift up the campus to you. Um, pray um, just that you'd give them peace during what has been a very uncertain, very unsettling time. Um, and I pray that they would just know that they have nothing to fear in you. Um, I pray that they would know how loved and how precious they are to you. And just particularly during um, a time of what would be great, great transition for everyone whether people are moving on to go to university or changing years at school, going from GCSEs to A-levels, whatever this looks like, Father, I just pray that you're with them and that they know you're there um, and that you can help them through this um, time. And yeah, no, I just, I just really pray this in your name. Amen. That's it for day two. We'll see you guys tomorrow.